Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about the books I've read this week. Um, I don't know why I say that each time, like it's this brand new idea that I've just come up with. Uh, <laughs> just don't do this every week. But anyway, uh, here are the books I read this week and it's been a fun one. Um, uh, you will notice a pattern in the sense that four of the five um, are to do with the Rathbones Prize. Um, just because I'm on a little bit of a kick of trying to read all of them before the shortlist, uh, was before the winner's announcement rather at the end of the month, but also because we've got the International Booker Prize coming and we've got uh, The Republic of Consciousness will be wrapping up. So just a few books that I'm kind of sort of trying to keep tabs on in some ways and sort of what have you. Anyway, that all aside, let's get started with the books. I also want to just quickly drop in at the beginning here that um, as actually happened to me when I was reading them, three of these books dealt with Alzheimer's. Um, one really explicitly, the other two kind of a bit more incidentally. And um, I don't think I was necessarily ready for that with uh, sort of going through some of that with my family at the moment. And so uh, having three of them hit in a row was sort of a, not exactly the um, the dream, uh, but yeah, just worth saying regardless. So um, I'll mention those books quickly first. Um, and again, not all of them explicitly talk about it, but, but there we go. So first up is Time Shelter by Georgi Gospodinov, and I'm fairly sure that's probably going to be Georgi or something else, and I've completely misunderstood how to say this name. Anyway, um, translated by Angela Rodell, and this book um, from the original Bulgarian is this um, really bizarre and wonderfully interesting book um, that I absolutely loved. Um, I did a separate re uh, a separate video on it, which will have gone live by the time this one has gone live. Um, and um, the thing I found with that was as I started talking about the book for the review, that I realised just how much I'd enjoyed this book. And um, so the, the core idea really is that it deals a lot with the idea of past and of time and of memory and all of these other things that go into how nations tell stories about themselves. So obviously we have Bulgaria feature as he's a Bulgarian writer, but it focuses quite a lot, especially on sort of central um, and sort of Western Europe, really. Um, and a key part of what it starts to bring up is this idea of what does it look like to go between some of these these areas of time and history. So we have this central character of Gostin, um, who is this really quite bizarre character. Um, and he seems to be basically time jumping. Um, Right at the beginning of the book, we get um, a short indication of what might be about to go on because the the quotes, the sort of ep epigrams at the beginning of the book um, start having his name in it before the book has even begun. So, you know, there'll be a quote attributed to him and Shakespeare or a quote attributed to um, just Costine or, or something else. And we start to get this idea that he's already this very strange historical figure or what have you. And the book then starts to follow that idea up and we start to see him throughout history. So particularly European history, um, there's a lot talking about 1939 and the 1940s, so obviously big around World War II and the destructive effect that has on Europe. Um, but it deals a lot with so many other aspects um, of that within the book. So not to spoil anything, but towards the end of the book, there is... Um, a referendum where countries decide which decade they'd like to stay in or to move back into. Um, and so that starts to create this idea of what what would a nation say if you said, when's your golden age? When's your perfect time? So I, I thought this book was so fascinating and really, really interesting. A memory and Alzheimer's come up in this as well because of just the, the sheer notion of what um, uh, what's kind of being dealt with here. This idea of uh, memory as both a personal individual thing that you have about your childhood and about the, the world you've grown up in but also the thing that's passed along but also that uh, but also this idea of memory as a nation so what's the collective memory of a nation and how does that differ from individual um, memory and there are lots of really really exciting things in this book and I, I think it's a real triumph um, in many many ways so yeah the more I've thought about this book since the more I've liked it. So I, I would really highly recommend this. Then I started moving into the Rathbones Prize um, a bit more. So I then read uh, In Love by Amy Bloom. And this is where th this book is the one I knew was more explicitly about Alzheimer's. Um, so this is a non-fiction book where Amy Bloom talks about the 
essentially, yeah, the very difficult decision that she and her husband have to make. So her husband is uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's after a sort of quite a bit of time of him starting to lose bits of memory. And it's a very short book, but in it, she basically details the, the, the journey that they go on together to go to have um, her husband, Paul, end his life. Um, not the cheeriest topic for a book, but I think it's so beautifully done within this within this very, very slim book, just about um, how she talks about some really quite tricky things. There's a there's an economy of words in this book that I actually found really quite brilliant because it doesn't spend passages upon passages just going into the depths of some of these things. It leaves things unsaid at times. It's a quiet book. Um, and I really appreciated that. I, I I think this book would have been quite a hard one to stomach if there'd been these lengthy passages really going into detail or kind of putting all the pain down onto the page. I, I, I think what's actually really beautiful here is the the strength of their relationship and their love for each other is the thing that shines through more deeply than the grief of him um him sort of ending his life um and so it's a really heavy book as you'd imagine from that but i think it does it in a in a clever way that it never feels like it's too down in the doldrums about it all it's almost a very practical book of here's what we did to to go through the steps and to allow amy bloom herself to have a little bit of, of a chance for for grieving and for healing um as well so really beautiful if difficult to read book um and then also staying on the rathbones non-fiction prize um i read the passengers by will ashen um which is such a bizarre little book and I really enjoyed what it does here. So the the idea of the passengers is these are sort of scraps of conversations or interviews with people who are left nameless in this book. Um, and so uh, Will Ashen's basically walking around having these conversations and people are coming out with some of the deepest things within themselves. Um, so some of them, for example, told told stories about their families and, and Alzheimer's. Some One of them speaks about... Um, immigrating to the UK and um, the difficulties that he's had within all of that. Another person um, talks about, you know, things that they've never told anybody else. Somebody talks about mental health. Somebody talks about, um, you know, a, a scary situation they found where they almost got run over um, while they were on a bike. Just all of these little things of kind of the secrets that people don't really tell um, each other. And... I found it really quite a beautiful little book because, again, there's this this sort of idea of what are these, you know, we can be around people all the time and maybe never hear some of these deepest, darkest secrets from people. Um, these are the things you maybe don't tell friends, but actually a random person saying you're going to be anonymous and giving you a microphone, you might tell them. And so I, I think there's a lot of really interesting things in this book and, and a book that I would not have expected. Um, it's 180 chapters, which sounds at first like it's tons, but those chapters or breaks, are, sometimes they're a couple of sentences long, sometimes it's a couple of pages. It's just a really interesting way of kind of almost listening in to these private conversations in a kind of nosy way, but in a really beautiful way of the sort of what's really complicated and difficult about being a human, right? That there's all this... Um, yeah, there's so sort of so much that we carry as humans. So I thought this was a really, really interesting, if very strange, little book. Then, um, in terms of poetry on the Rathbones, um, I promise these will be a bit more spaced out in future, hopefully. Um, but it just sort of fell this way this week. Um, I read Fiona Benson's Ephemeron, um, a really stunning, gorgeous collection of poetry. Um, and so the core idea, really, in some ways, it's sort of I mean, I think it's meant to be four parts, but it kind of there are two parts that feel like they take up the most um, space in the book. Um, one is sort of a, a retelling of, um, of Greek myths, particularly about women, particularly about uh, about sort of violence and sexual violence. Um, so it's a really difficult one to stomach, but her writing is incredible. Um, and the part that really appealed to me is the, the first section, um, which is all really about essentially insect life, which again doesn't necessarily on the surface sound like it'd be the most directly interesting thing. But there's something about the way that Fiona Benson captures the sort of magic of nature, the, her word choices, the 
the the kind of the cadence of these lines. There's something so absolutely beautiful about how she does it. And um, I was just completely hooked with, you know, we, we might just have a, a short poem just about a caterpillar or a short poem about a butterfly or a type of moth or what have you. But there's something about her spending time observing them, writing about them and kind of building this world with it, you know, around them that is so captivating. And so I was just really drawn in to, to what this book was doing. Um, yeah, and I'd really highly recommend it. I'm, I'm, I, I read bits of poetry here and there. I'm by no means an expert, and I don't think you have to be an expert anyway to read it, but um, this was a collection that I sort of forced myself to purposely slow down and take a sections, and, and I think that really helped with me um, just feeling, yeah, this is just a beautifully, beautifully done book. And finally, um, unfortunately, I have to end it on a tiny bit of a bum note here, but uh, Scary Monsters by Michelle de, Kratz, uh, de Kretzer, um is also on the the Rathbones shortlist uh, this time for fiction. Um, and there's a lot that I did enjoy about the book. I think I just struggled with it overall. But um, essentially, the core idea is this is a split book. So halfway through, it, well, the, the book basically ends halfway through um, and then flips over. And uh, the idea being that we've got two different stories. And I think the thing that maybe threw me, um, and maybe this was, maybe this affected my enjoyment of it in an unfair way, because I think actually, if I'd gone in with a slightly different perception, maybe I'd have enjoyed it more. Um, the two stories are sort of connected, but not as directly as this might make you think. Um, so I think I was expecting that the two stories would really heavily interweave, you know, we'd get some, some of the same characters, we'd get some of the, the same events or whatever, just with different timings. Uh, but essentially the core part is um, the, the sort of earlier story, I read it this way around first, um, but the core sort of story from this involves a series of characters um, in, in and around various parts of Europe, um, but mostly sort of dealing with the fallout of various sort of teenager -y kind of in some ways things or young adult things and dealing with topics around pregnancy and around kind of growing into being adults and what to do next and all of these sorts of things and I felt a bit disconnected with this part of the story I have to admit I, I don't know why I think I never quite got into it and then never really managed to, to recover but the first bit that I the re bit I'd read first I thought was really um, interesting and effective for the way it, it kind of ex explores various ideas so this talks a lot about Australia um, and a sort of future version of Australia that in some ways isn't radically far away from um, from some policies that have been around in the US, in Australia, in various other places. Um, but these sort of really racist border policies. Um, and so we start this book with um, Islam having been banned. Um, and that there are these sort of free, uh, these sort of, uh, these, I suppose, fire zones, I think they're kind of protected fire zones. And these are the, the areas where people are protesting and resisting and what have you. And so there's this very much this sort of dystopian sense of here are people inside, those other people are out there. And so you have um, Muslims who have to make a choice basically between giving up their faith or at least not being demonstrably Muslim, you know, not praying in public, not kind of wearing any symbols that might be associated with it. Um, and various other things, um, or being kind of outcast or, or killed or, or what have you. And part of that idea seems to be this really interesting discussion around state control, about violence, about various other things. And in some ways, that's the kind of part of the link between that and this bit, which is um, in this part of the book, we sort of see maybe 10, 20 years earlier, sense of personal freedom. And so there's a really interesting sort of discussion in some ways going on between these two bits of the book. Um, I think I just struggled with the second, uh, with, with this part. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't know, I think maybe I wanted a little bit more of a direct link. I don't know if that makes me a really lazy reader in this, but I, um, I, I'd, I'd love to hear from somebody who'd really loved it and the reason they really loved it. Um, I've had a little look on Goodreads to sort of try and understand why people felt that way. But I think, you know, there is a discussion going on in this book about personal freedom and, you know, the, the kind of freedoms that sort of are in this part of the book that seem to be quite challenged, but are mostly okay, become a lot more threatened in this part. And particularly then, um, you know, there's a, there's actually, there's a really um, clever observation, I think, in this part of the book that talks about, um, there's a, 
because the Australian, the sort of future Australian environmental policy is to not have one um, and sort of basically be anti-environment. Um, if you do anything that might resemble being good to the environment, like recycling or, um, I don't know, like using a reusable bottle or, or something, that can be looked on with suspicion as potentially being against the government because you've gone against government policy. Um, and so I thought that was quite an interesting and sort of funny observation, but I... I don't know, I think I really struggled, because I really struggled to connect to the other the other part, it felt like I'd read sort of a half book. Um, but yeah, intrigued to, to see what other people think. Anyway, I've gone on for really long about a book that I, I had mixed feelings about. Um, but overall, I can see why people enjoy it. I think it's just, it just didn't hit me in the right way. Anyway, I've been bothered Booker talking about the books I've read this week. Um, very rough bones prize inspired. Uh, I hope you're doing really well. I hope things are going well with you and speak to you all soon. Take care.